a simple proof that pi is irrational. Begin by assuming just the opposite, that pi is rational and can be expressed as a ratio of two positive integers, a and b. That's the same thing as saying that pi is a solution to this linear equation with integer coefficients. Next, we define a family of functions with that linear equation inside it, and n can be any positive integer. Regardless of what integer we choose for n, the zeros of the function will be 0 and pi. Furthermore, all the derivatives of this function will have non-negative integral values. To see why, let's see what this function looks like for n equals 3. When we unravel it like this, we see that in the numerator, we have a polynomial function where the exponent on x is 3 and higher. Now, as we take derivatives, this could quickly become very messy, but we have a trick to keep it in line. Because the exponent on x is always 3 or higher, when we take the derivatives, we can ignore the x with the larger exponents. So let's see what this looks like. The first derivative ends up being 3a cubed times x squared all over the factorial of 3, plus a bunch of stuff which is more polynomials in x. Then we take the second derivative, and finally the third derivative, the x disappears, except for the stuff where it still exists, so that all becomes 0 when x is 0. And also notice that the 3 factorial and the coefficients, 3, 2, and 1, in the numerator will cancel each other out, and we're left with a cubed. Something similar will happen for any value of n that we choose. So all of the derivatives will be either 0 or have some integer value when x is 0. We also want to show that the function and all its derivatives will be 0 at x equals pi. To do this, it's easier if we examine the derivatives with the a minus bx portion intact. Here's the first derivative again. All of the other derivatives will have portions in the numerator with a minus b times x. So we'll just look at the part that has the smallest exponent. As you can see, as we go down to the third derivative, we finally end up with 3, 2, 1 canceling the 3 factorial, and we have b cubed times x cubed in the numerator. All this stuff before that has the a minus b x to some power, and because x is pi, that all becomes zero. So now let's see what happens when we put pi into the x. And remember, pi is a over b. The b's cancel out, and we end up with a cubed again. And we can generalize this to any value of n. Therefore, f of pi and all the derivatives will also be an integer. Now we are going to create a series, uh, we could call it big F of x, and it consists of the function and its even numbered derivatives added and subtracted from each other. And to that series we add the second derivative of big F of x. And it sounds like a lot to bite off at once, but when we put it all together, you see that we have a lot of canceling. And finally, the result is f of x. So it's a lot of work to end up right back where we started, but this is important work. Now we will take another combination uh, with the big F functions and find their derivative. When we take that derivative, it simplifies to 
this beast. And now that bit in the brackets, we've seen that before. That was the result of our previous equation. It's just f of x. So this derivative simplifies to f of x times the sine of x. Now that we've dug that hole, let's fill it in again. We take the integral of f of x sine x, and that ends up being just the original derivative that we got it from. Now we evaluate that integral over the real numbered integral between 0 and pi. Now each of the parts, f of x and sine of x, they're positive in that interval. So the whole function, f of x times sine of x, it'll also be positive. The exceptions are the endpoints. When x is 0 and x is pi, these are the zeros of the function. But since it's positive in between these endpoints, this leads us to conclude that somewhere in there is a maximum value. We don't need to find that maximum value, but we do need to put a cap on it. And to do that, we'll find the maximum possible values for each of the parts. So for f of x, when x is pi, x to the power of n will be pi to the n. And that's the maximum that that part can be. And when x is 0, then the bit in the brackets is at its maximum of a to the power of n. And sine of x, its maximum value is going to be 1. Now we know that f of x times the sine of x, it's positive, but it's less than this expression that we've created. It will never take on this value because x will never be both 0 and pi, but we know that it will not exceed this value, and that is important. Now we will evaluate the definite integral over the interval of 0 to pi. And when the dust settles, we end up with big F of pi plus big F of 0. And remember, because the parts are all integers, these have to be integers. So the result is going to be an integer. This summarizes what we've concluded so far. The area under this curve is going to have an integer value. But here's the rub. We can crank that number n as high as we like, which makes this expression pi to the n times a to the n over n factorial arbitrarily small, which means that area becomes arbitrarily small. And arbitrarily small means less than 1. And we don't have any integers between 0 and 1. So we hit a brick wall. What is the issue? Well, we were assuming that a and b exist. We resolved the contradiction by rejecting our original assumption that pi is the ratio of two positive integers, a and b, so pi is irrational. Bob's your uncle. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed that, remember to subscribe and cheers.